here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. I was able to do an interview with an author of a new book. I think it surprised him very much that I was not and am not a fan. Here's that interview. You know, of course, I like books. I'm always talking about various books, and there's a brand new one about to come out. Well, just pretty soon. Going to be out on the 26th of September. Title of it is American Gun, The True Story of the AR-15 by Cameron McWhorter and Zusha Ellenson. And Zusha joins us right now. Hey, Zusha, thank you for being here. Interesting book. Where did you get the idea for this in the first place? Well, obviously, as a national news reporter, we cover a lot of mass shootings. So unfortunately, that was my entryway into this story. We started looking at the gun that a lot of mass shooters were using. And then I started covering the gun industry, and that became my full-time beat. And as we looked into the origins of the AR-15, we were just fascinated, surprised, and awed by the story. And we knew we had to write a book about it. And you're writing for the Wall Street Journal, right? That's right. My full-time gig is writing for the Wall Street Journal, where I cover guns, politics, and violence. Okay. So this is billed as American Gun, the true story of the AR-15. A lot of history in here. you got you know, dozens of pages of notes at the end. How long have you been working on this? We've been working on this book for the past th- three or four years. And I will tell you, one of the most fascinating characters that we found in our research is, of course, the inventor, Eugene Stoner. Your listeners probably have heard of him, but there's really little out there about him, about the type of guy he was, how he came to invent this rifle, um, how he struggled against the military bureaucracy to get it adopted. It's just a fascinating tale. I mean, in talking with his family, we found out these stories about when he was a kid growing up in the Coachella Valley in Southern California, and he was just fascinated with explosions. There was this really funny time he got himself a bunch of parts from his friend's dad's, and he built himself a little primitive cannon. And he was aiming it at the neighbor's house when his father rushed in and said, I told you only to shoot that thing at the dump. So he didn't open fire on the neighbor's house, actually. (laughs) Actually, sounds like a lot of kids, though, uh, the way they grew up with, whether firecrackers or cherry bombs or whatever, just playing with stuff. But then that led him to be, you know, a preeminent and premier firearms designer, the AR-15 of course, was adopted by the military as the M-16, which became the M-4. And then you have the split where you have the semi-auto versus the select fire or full auto, the semi-auto available to civilians and the select fire and full auto available not just to the military, but also to law enforcement. And somehow those two get conflated. And I, I find that to be the case in your book. There doesn't seem to be a lot of distinction between the two. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think we try to draw a pretty clear distinction by explaining what the military rifle does. Of course, it's select fire, can fire on full auto, and the semi-automatic civilian version that's, you know, now the most popular rifle in America. I I think we really try to explain the difference there. Um, I think what's happened in the debate is that there, you know, gun debate that's been going on for decades, they often get confused and people get confused about it. Sometimes that's on purpose, sometimes not. I was going to say, wasn't that Josh Sugarman's quote about the whole idea is to create the term assault weapon so people don't know the difference so we can actually frighten the public into wanting to ban these? Yeah, that was a really fascinating part. You know, looking at the early days of the gun debate and the strategies on both sides. I mean, I think what, what you saw in the late 80s and the early 90s, right, was that gun control activists, you know, they'd been wanting to ban handguns for a long time, but they realized that they weren't going to be able to do that. The resistance was too strong. And so they really started focusing on these guns, you know, the semi-automatic versions of military weapons, like, you know, AKs, ARs, and that sort of thing. Things that look scary. Yeah. And so and so what happened is they were trying to push this um, idea of, of banning ARs and AKs, but it didn't really get any traction, honestly, until the 1989 Stockton schoolyard shooting. Right. And then all they need is a good tragedy to start jumping on this. And I'm just going to say for me, and I've owned AR-15 mm-hmm. since 1994, because when the, uh, the original Clinton gun ban came into effect, I said, you know what, I don't own one, but if you're going to tell me I can't, I'm going to buy two. And since then, I probably own Oh, I would say somewhere between 10 and 20 ARs myself. 
Mm-hmm. I didn't find, and this book is billed as American Gun, the true story of the AR-15. I didn't find anything in this book, nothing that reflected my lived reality with the AR-15, whether it's used for recreation, for competition, for hunting, or the tens of millions of people who own these legally, responsibly, and don't use it for crime. It seems like this book is only about crime and gun control, not about the Mm -hmm. AR-15. Yeah, certainly a large part of this, you know, the very beginning of the book is really about the development of the AR-15, right? And we go into how Stoner developed it and why he developed it, how he was able to do it, and then the big fight to get it adopted by the military and how the military bureaucracy really kind of messed with his design so that the rifles that were sent over to Vietnam with our soldiers really didn't work. And, you know, they jammed. But that's all been written before. That's all been covered with McNamara screwing up the contracts and screwing up the Mm -hmm. ammunition. I mean, that that's known news. We we knew that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And for me, I mean, I just got to ask you, how can you say this is the story of the AR-15 and not talk about the majority of the use of the AR-15 and focus on the minority of the use, which is for crime? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, in the book, we interviewed a number of gun owners, you know, going back even to the 80s and 90s, when these were only owned by a very few people. I mean, we interviewed this. It was really interesting. So you, you remember, you've been an owner of AR-15s for a long time. When, when did you buy your first one? 94. 94. Interesting. And why did you buy it? As I said, when the Clinton gun ban came along, also known as the assault weapon ban, and they said, you're not going to be able to own them. I said, well, I don't own any, but if you're going to tell me I can't, I will start buying them now. And that's why why I started. And probably that act itself of trying to ban the gun actually created the demand for the gun. Right. And that that was such a fascinating moment in time. So um, you know, we interviewed folks who had been owning AR-15s in the 70s and 80s. These are mainly collectors, but it was such a small niche market back then, right? I mean, this wasn't a mainstream product. And as soon as the Clinton gun ban came through, the assault weapons ban that passed 94, people who owned the AR-15 suddenly saw it as a political symbol, you know, as a line in the sand. Mm-hmm. And that that gave it a lot more potency in the market. And it was really interesting to look at the numbers of production, right? I mean, um, gun owners know this, but a lot of people don't know this. You know, there were more AR-15s made during the 10 years it was banned than in, you know, a couple decades before it was banned. Right. Um, oh, it, yeah. Well, which I is, say, uh, which is a fascinating. It, yeah. It called really fascinating. To it. I mean, I, and I should say that, let's see, God, when would I have been in the early 60s when I was 11 years old? I killed my first deer and went deer hunting with a semi automatic rifle with a detachable magazine, shooting a 308, which is considerably more powerful than an AR 15. And right. so, and of course, Teddy Roosevelt used a semi automatic rifle to hunt with 100 years ago. There's nothing new about semi autos. So there's nothing different about the AR 15 from other semi autos. So the question I have for you. And look, as you know, only too well, there are lies of commission, there are lies of omission. And I see this book as being full of omissions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I really felt we tried to interview as many people as possible from as many perspectives. You know, we, we interviewed folks on all sides of the debate. Um, but I mean, to be honest, no one would care about this rifle that much if there weren't a lot of mass shootings where it was used. Really? And so that's. Wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait. Really? We've got tens of millions of people who own these. You're saying the reason they own them is because of mass shootings? No, that's not what I said at all. The reason that this is a topic of discussion in politics and policymaking um, is because the gun you know, has been used in some of the most deadly mass shootings. And yet the FBI says more people are killed with fists and feet than they are with AR-15s. No, obviously. And we say that, yes, that's a good point, Tom, and we point that out in our book. The vast majority of murders are carried out with handguns. We know that. Everyone knows that as well. Um, So this this is not not really a book about the AR-15. This is really a book about politics. Uh, No, this is the the history of the AR-15 from its invention to its use in Vietnam. Except that you've left out the majority of the use. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you, you you haven't talked in here about... Three gun competitions. You haven't talked about Camp Perry competitions. You haven't talked about hunting with them. I mean, there's a there's a a lick and a promise, and I'll hit it a lick as I go by. But ninety eight percent of this book is about politics. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I, I disagree with that, but we're all entitled to our own opinions. Um, I, you know, we interviewed a number of gun owners. We interviewed folks from all sides of the debate. And we really wanted to, you know, this to be a very objective history. From my perspective, I don't find it to be that at all. I find it to be mm-hmm. an entirely slanted and biased piece. Mm-hmm. I just, mm-hmm. I don't find this to be at all the true story of the AR-15. I find it to be a, you know, let me push the narrative of the AR-15 as being used in mass shootings and very little else. That's what I got out of it. Hmm, that's interesting. And what did you think of the, you know, the, the whole story of Stoner and his life? Well, the story of Stoner is interesting, but as I say, uh, old news. For those of us who are into it, we understand that. Now, yes, if you're talking to an audience that doesn't know anything about the development of the AR-15, then of course, that's news. They may find that interesting, but I just, again, that to me doesn't at all ameliorate what I see as being a very biased look at this subject. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, I, I'm sorry you didn't enjoy the book, Tom, but, you know, I respect your opinion. Um, I, I would encourage people to read it for themselves. Uh, you know, I, I think we've done a very fair job and we've interviewed, uh, as I said, we've interviewed people who have led the movement against assault weapons bans. Again, politics. Right. Yeah. And, see, see, you that's, know, what, so, that's what I'm saying. You think this story, you think the AR-15 is a political story. From your perspective, the AR-15 is about mass shootings, it's about politics, it's about gun bans. From my perspective and the perspective perspective of millions of people, the AR-15 is just another rifle, like every other rifle. And it works mm-hmm. exactly the same. And we use them for hunting, we use it for recreation, we use it for self-defense, mm-hmm. we use them for competition. And we look at this and go, wow, this is what you see when you think about this gun that I use Every single day, or I go out to the range with every day, all you see, it appears when I look at this, is crime and mass murder. No, I, I mean, a large part of the book also deals with how this became the most popular rifle in America. And we talk a lot about that and the companies and the personalities behind those companies and how they you know, grew from this really ragtag group in the 80s and 90s. You know, you had Bushmaster, DPM, DPMS, Olympic Arms. And then how this rifle that was really a niche product that was pretty much, you know, avoided by most people became such a huge success on the commercial market. That's a, that's a very large part of the book. Okay. Well, look, I, you know, it's a huge work and I know you worked on it for a long time. I, I see this as being, and just, you know, have to allow me this. This is what I literally would expect from Wall Street Journal type of writing, of not seeing what we see at all. It, to me, it's a great example of we're out here doing something and your reporting on it is completely 180 degrees, the opposite of our reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, let me ask you this question, though. Um, if you were writing a history of the AR-15, uh, would you think it was appropriate to write about the mass shootings? I would hit it a lick and I would move on because that that is not, I mean, Let's let's be realistic. If there are 20 million or whatever, we don't know what there are, 25 million of these out there. Yeah. And a 200 of them, no more than, are used in mass shooting. Is that where you focus? Seriously? But I'm, yeah, I'm asking you. I mean, so no, you, what the, part the, of the story the, do you think that the answer, is? The answer would be no. I mean, your folk, this is a book on politics. This is not a book about a gun. This is a book about politics and gun bans and the media playing up. And over overplaying, in my viewpoint, the use of a particular platform in crime and playing into the Josh Sugarman, let's confuse people with, we'll call it an assault weapon, and people won't know the difference between a machine gun and a semi-auto, and that will help us ban it. And I see this book as a perfect example of the media buying into that and being a part of it and actually being the PR arm for the gun ban movement. Okay. Well, I, I strongly disagree with you. I think we're very clear about what the gun does. You know, the differences between the M16 and the civilian version, the AR-15. Um, and I, I really think we did take a very objective approach to this. It's very fact-based. Um, but, but at the, you know, the truth of the matter is, right, if there, um, if there were no mass shootings and there weren't these huge mass shootings where perpetrators use the AR-15, you know, it wouldn't be the story, obviously. 
but there well, are. Yeah, and yeah, and the, the fact of the fact be, of the it matter be the story that you want to tell. But the fact of the matter is, is that objects, you know, take on meaning to a culture um, beyond just the object. They become symbolic, and you know, this gun has been become symbolic to gun rights yeah. supporters as a symbol of the Second Amendment, and it's become symbolic to gun control advocates. Um, and what, you know, and what, to do with mass here's a question for you. What role did the media play in playing this up and overplaying the use of a particular firearm that looks evil and you get the what I believe to be the talking points from the gun ban industry? I think the mm -hmm. media and Wall Street Journal and a book like this play into that and you're basically being used. Mm -hmm. There you go. Look, I got to run. Zeus, thank you. I appreciate all the effort that went into this. I know how hard it is to write a book. This is just not one that I'm going to recommend. All right, that was that interview. Obviously, Zusha was very surprised at my reaction to his book. There you go. Got to call it as I see it. 866-TALK-GUN. We'll be right back with more gun talk.